aren't you glad that Jesus looks past your faults and saw your need? What would happen if he did not do that? So I am very honored to be up here. It's like last time, any chance I get to preach, I tell you when pastor asked me, he goes, would you like to preach Sunday night when he's gone? I, I got so excited. Like, I love these opportunities, but I'm very grateful to be up here. Thank you guys for all coming tonight. I will say, so we've been here for several months now. Um, the last time I preached was a couple months now to several months. I will say, and Miss Nina would say the same, Miss Nina, my wife Nina, we've been talking to teens a lot. But this does feel like home. We've made friendships that um, are some of the greatest friendships we've ever had. We love this area. And we were t- I was talking to my mom and dad last night, and we were saying, this is our home now. And we, we love it. We're um, super excited to be here. Thanks for guys- Thank you guys for having us. Thank you for letting us um, take care and teach your teenagers and stuff like that. We really do enjoy it. Um, I, will want- I do want to say one thing, um, and I'm not, hopefully he may not even be watching. I don't know. But um, never take for granted that the pastor that you have. At Bible college, you see pastors coming every day for chapel, and you hear stories about different pastors, and they did this, this church, and this church broke up. And what you guys have here is special. And um, he's one of the most patient guys I've ever met. The other day, he was, um, we, I forget what kind of saw it was. He was teaching me how to use a saw. And <laughs> I almost killed myself. I almost cut the wire and electrocuted myself. But he was like, oh, no, you got to do it this way. He, anything he does, he's very patient. He wants to teach people. So I just wanted to give that word of encouragement. You guys have a pastor, unlike many out there. So um, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter number 10. Hop in here. So we may not go very late tonight. Um, One of the advantages to having a new preacher up here is that I'm not very long-winded yet. So we may be out of here before seven o'clock. So and and all God's people said amen. So (laughs) Luke chapter 10, and let's begin reading in verse 38. And the Bible says, And when it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she should help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good, that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Amen. Christian people, especially in the United States, are some of the most busy people you will ever meet. At Bible college, me and my friends, you know, because in Bible college, you have all the wisdom in the world, right? And me, three or four of my friends went out to eat, and we started to gather up information about what we do at Bible college. We came to the conclusion that in all the universities in America, Bible college students are the busiest students. You say, why is that? Well, I will tell you why, because I want you to show, I want to show you guys how pitiful it is of what I went through. At Bible college, you study just like anyone else who goes to college. You eat food at certain times of the day, just like any other college out there. You have different curfews and different schedules that you have to follow, just like any other university. You have to study at night. You have to try, you have to get a certain grade to pass in that class, just like any other university. You have extracurricular activities like football and ultimate frisbee and all those things, just like every other university. But on top of all those things... You go to church Sunday morning. You go to church Sunday night. You go to church Wednesday night. Sunday morning, you also have ministry. Saturday morning, you go out soaring for two hours to invite people to church to work on sharing the gospel to people. Bible college is a busy place. If you are dedicated to doing your devotions before class every morning and making it to breakfast, you will wake up around 5.30 a.m. to 6 a.m., and your day won't be done until about 11 p.m., and you do it again and again and again, especially if you have a job. Now, I would, it would be safe for me to say that outside of Bible college students, Christians in general are busy people. You guys work a job like everyone else. You guys, um, you have your kids. You, your kids have sports games. You, you guys are busy, but on top of that, you also come to church. Wednesday night was a night as a kid you knew you had to straighten up 
because mom's had a long day, dad's had a long day, you just came home from sports practice, mom made a quick dinner, you get changed for church, dad, as soon as dad gets home, he changes five minutes, you're out the door and you're heading to church. You're at church for about, until about 8.30, you get home around 9, 9.30. Wednesdays are a long day. In my opinion, church people have the busiest schedule. Now, outside of Christians, I would, it would be safe to say that society as it is is getting busier and busier. Do you ever realize people, like, they get mad if their microwave doesn't make their food in one minute? Like, <laughs> come on, like, they're that busy, right? Society is busy. Tonight, when it comes to being busy and what we should do with that, I want to look at four lessons from two women, and let's see where we end up. Luke chapter 10 and verse 38, the Bible says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered, speaking about Jesus, into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him unto her house. The first thing I want to learn from this story is that there is a genuine respect. Growing up, when I heard this story of Mary and Martha, and I understood that, oh, Mary's at the feet of Jesus, and Martha is just so busy, she cares nothing about God. My mind is, Martha, what in the world are you doing? Like, Jesus is right there, and you're worrying about cooking a meal? Like, come on, what are you thinking? But as I got older, and as I read this story, Martha's actually not that bad as what we make her out to be. If you read that verse, Martha, as it said, a certain woman named Martha received him unto her house. Martha was the first one that saw Jesus come into town, says, Jesus, come stay at our house. Here, Jesus, come, come, come. And she had a genuine respect for Jesus. You can just picture it. She's in the kitchen, and she's making food, and something burns, and she throws it away and starts completely fresh again. You can see her walking out to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, do you have a refill? Jesus, do you need any more food? Here, I, I, she brings out more food even if Jesus isn't hungry, right? She wanted to make sure Jesus was taken care of. If you go in John chapter 12, there is another story of Mary Martha. And at the same, in the, in that, in, uh, sorry, in John chapter 12, it also says that Martha was busy serving. Now, in John chapter 12, Mary was also there, Jesus was also there, and Martha was running around trying to serve everyone. She wanted to make sure Jesus was taken care of. There was a genuine respect. When it comes to the respect of God, Jesus, um, our religion, it's amazing to me how far some things have come. When I was a kid, and I've seen all of you parents do it, every parent does it, right? And when you're a kid, you were taught you do not run in church. Like, if you got caught running in church, when you got home, it was not going to be a good time. Why? When I was a kid, my mom and dad says, you do not run in church. Why? Because it's respectful. You don't want to break anything. That is God's house. You do not want to disturb anything, right? As a kid, you learn that you go to the bathroom before church starts because you're not going to be the one who stands up and interrupts pastor. That's what I was taught as a kid. And all of it had to do with respect. In today's society, a pastor can walk into a room and no one will think twice. But you go 30, 40 years ago, a pastor walks in and everyone notices, that's the pastor, watch what we say. But in today's society, there is not that much respect for God. So before we go any farther in the story, before we start to dig into this passage, here's Martha, and she is so excited that Jesus is there. She wanted to make sure everything was taken care of. Jesus, do you need more drink? Do you need more food? She wanted to make sure Jesus was taken care of. The Bible says, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Martha had respect. It may be something small. She was just cooking a meal, but she was going to do it. Her, with her best ability, Martha wanted to please God. How's our respect for God? When we come to church, is it something that we're just, we just can't wait to get there? And when we, we sing, we listen to pastor, we have respect for other people. When we go out, are we saying words that people are like, oh, you're a Christian? What in the world? How is the respect for God? So first lesson, very simple, is there was a genuine respect for God. Number two. There was a glorifying love. A glorifying love. Let's begin reading in verse 39. The Bible says, And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So here we have, we've learned about the second sister, which her name is Mary. 
So the first sister, she is welcoming Jesus in, make sure Jesus has everything. We'll read about it in, in a little bit. But here's Mary at the feet of Jesus. If you go back to John chapter 12, which I mentioned earlier, it is the same Mary in John chapter 12 that breaks the alabaster box, that really expensive ointment, and washes Jesus' feet, takes her hair, and then dries his feet. She took a year's worth of wages in this, this ointment that is so expensive and used it on Jesus. Jesus starts to paint this picture about Mary, and he wanted to make sure everyone realized what Mary was doing. It said that Mary's life can be summed up in three verses. In Luke chapter 10, which, which we just read, the Bible says, and she sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. John eleven thirty two 32 says this, she fell down at his feet. John 12, 3 says, and she anointed the feet of Jesus. Here's Martha. She sees Jesus coming. Jesus, come in. She had a genuine, a genuine respect. She loved the Lord. Her brother, Lazarus, Jesus raised him from the dead. Like, wouldn't you have respect for someone who raised your brother from the dead? Like, yeah, it's common sense. Martha had respect. But we see Mary with this glorifying love that every chance she got, she was at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him and hearing his word. Psalms 95 verse 6 says this. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. When's the last time you got on your hands and knees and in your bedroom all by yourself, you just worship God for who he is? Psalm 63, verse 1 says this. Oh, God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Have you ever been so thirsty that's like all you can think about? On Wednesday nights when it gets really hot here in the summer, and as the teenagers, we go outside, we'll play a game or we'll do something, you know, that has a little bit of endurance to it. And when you come back in, we buy water, we buy soda for the teenagers. You know why? Because if they come in from a game, and they don't have water or soda to drink, I have completely lost their attention because all they can think about is, I really need some water. Can you go please buy me some water, right? Have you ever been so thirsty? Have you ever been so thirsty to want to worship God and be at his feet and hear his word? Have you ever been in a situation where you're just longing for that time where you can go to God, you can go to church and hear pastors preach and say, God, thank you so much for what you give us. God, help me learn something from your word. When you get a chance to hear from God, do you take it? Mary, she was helping Martha. She was helping her um, serve and all that and prepare for Jesus before Jesus got there. When soon as Jesus got there, she, he, she is at his feet. In every passage that Mary's in, she is at Jesus' feet. Now, I just mentioned the world is busy. Get me. I, I, I know it. The more and more I get older, the more and more I know the world is busy. But when you have those 5, 10, maybe 15 minutes to spend with God alone, are you thirsting for that? Or something like, well, I, I got to iron my clothes. I got to do something else. And you just forget that. Mary's at the feet of Jesus. And she's, at one point, she's using all her money to glorify God. And in this passage, she's at the feet longing to hear what Jesus is going to say. So number one, we have a genuine respect. Number two, we have a glorifying love. And number three, there is a great load. Look at verse, um, let's re begin reading at verse 40. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she should help me. But Martha was cumbered about. Well, what's cumbered mean? The Greek definition of cumbered means this. To draw away, to pull from, to distract. Once again, have you ever been distracted? Uh, not too long ago, I was driving down the road. Do you ever like just zone out while you're driving? And like it feels like an eternity, and you finally like snap back in it, and you realize you're driving, like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad I just not, I didn't wreck my car, right? It's very easy to get distracted. 
At Bible college, if you've never been to Lancaster, California, it is one weird place. Like, the first time I ever walked into Walmart, there's these two dudes full out fist fighting. And my mom was looking. She's like, where am I going to leave my son? Like, she was, like, scared. Like, Lancaster is a crazy place. Well, it's like five minutes from school, and me, me and two of my buddies went to Walmart. And as we're walking in, there's this dude walking out, and he had this cart of groceries that was, I don't know how he fit all the groceries. Like, it was like a mountaintop of groceries in this basket. And you can tell he went in there with a purpose. Like, he was walking out. He was walking really fast. And as we're sitting there, so you can see the cart clear as day. All my friends are like, this dude probably just spent a fortune on food, right? And as he's walking out, this man slowly began to slow his walk. And as he looked to the right, where the parking spaces are in between, there's like this little median at that Walmart there in Lancaster, California, and they have like these little trees. The type of trees that if you would grab it and pull on it, there's a good chance it might snap. Like those, like it's like a small little tree, right? We look at this dude who is now let go of his cart. He's looking at this tree, and as we kind of went like this from the truck and Walmart parking lot, there is this dead bird that is stuck to a string that is attached to the tree. I don't know how the bird got caught in that string, but apparently it got caught in the string and then died there because it couldn't get food or water. This man sees this dead bird, crawls to the top of that little tree. The tree's starting to go, and this man is up there shaking the tree, and that poor little bird is just flapping back and forth. And we're sitting there dying, like, what is this man doing? Isn't it amazing that distractions happen so fast? But you know what's really bad about distractions? Distractions is that one thing that can make us forget about the one thing we are trying to accomplish. Here, Martha, we, we already established she, she's serving. She wants to make sure Jesus is taken care of. And she says she was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she should help me. The very reason that she is serving is the very thing that she interrupts. Now, knowing Jesus, he's probably sitting at this table, he's eating, he's either teaching or he's talking to fellow friends or whoever's in the house. And Martha's so worried about making sure Jesus has everything he needs, but then she gets so messed up in these distractions and she has so much work to get done that she barges in and says, God, Jesus, what are you doing? You see my sister sitting here? Have her come help me. And she interrupts the very thing that she's trying to serve. She, she, in a way, she ruins it for herself. 2 Timothy 2, 3, 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4 says this. Therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So be a good soldier. Don't be an average soldier. Don't be a bad soldier. Be a good soldier. Soldier, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. When a soldier goes to battle, now, there may be someone in this church who, I believe there are, who've actually gone to battle. Like, that's, to me, that's mind-boggling. I I can't imagine, like, the the stress and how you get in there. But what I do know is when a soldier goes to war, he has to leave some things behind. Now, there are some good things, and there are some bad things. Good things is, he would have to leave his family. Like, I'm sure that's horrible, but it's something that's good in his life that he has to get rid of. He has to get rid of his kids. He has to get rid of the job he had before he went to the military. He has to get rid of some things. A good soldier would also have to get rid of some bad things. Maybe some pride. Maybe some of that feeling of, oh, I am independent. I want to do what I want to do. They have to get rid of those things. In this world that we live in, there are so many distractions that can easily pull us away from the very thing that we're most passionate about, and that's Jesus. In Revelation chapter 4, Jesus goes through, a, he, he lists out some churches there, and he gets to the church of Ephesus. And as Jesus starts to ex- express what this church did good, God says, and I know your works. He talks about, I know how you labored. You guys had patience. You fought through the end. This church was doing good works. They were busy. They were a busy church. They were trying to strive for Jesus. You could tell that in the verses. But then Jesus gets to verse 4 and says this. Nevertheless, I have something that gets against thee. 
because thou hast left thy first love. There may be some things in your life that are good things. It may be your kids. It may be your wife. It may be your job. There are some good things in your life. But what is more important than your own relationship with Jesus Christ? A soldier will not get interfered or will not get themselves entangled with this life. Psalms 46.10 says this. Be still and know that I am God. When we get to a point in our lives where we are so busy, and there may be good things, that may be a reason why we're so busy, but if we get to the point where we're so busy that our own relationship with Jesus Christ becomes less and less and less important, it may be time just to go, you are God. Mary was doing her best to try to serve God. She was. She was doing her best, making sure Jesus was taken care of, and she gets so distracted. And it's amazing to me how the rest of the story goes. Lesson number four is that there is a greater lesson to this. Verse 41. And Jesus answereth and said unto her, Martha, Martha. Isn't it amazing when you read scripture how God can speak and it's like everything just goes. She's, you hear pots flying in the kitchen and Martha's going crazy. She's going, oh, I can't do this all on my own. She walks in and says, Jesus, give me my sister Mary. I need help. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. God says, I, I, Martha, I see you. I know inside, deep inside, you want to do your very best for me. Because I can see you are just loaded about with so many things to do. I can see that. God's sitting here today saying, Tri-City Baptist Church, I can see. You guys are doing so much. Your lives are so busy and you're trying to do what's right. Verse 42. But one thing is needful. Martha, you're doing such a good thing. You're, you're trying your hardest. There's just one thing you're missing. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Well, what was that good part? That good part was her sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to his word. There's a story in the Bible called about about the rich young ruler. We all probably know that story. He comes to Jesus and says, I've kept all the commandments. I have all, the Bible says he fared sumptuously. He had everything he needed. He walks to Jesus and said, hey. What can I do? Look look how much I've done. Can I follow you? All these different things. And God says, you lack one thing. He goes, sell everything you have and follow me. Everything he tried to do with his own power was not good enough. The only thing that he lacked was following Jesus. Like I mentioned before, we have busy lives. We have things to do here, things to do here, and everything. And like Martha, we can get so distracted by all that that we miss the main reason why we're even here in the first place. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says this. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that our Lord, he shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve Lord Christ. God's not saying here, hey, you guys don't need to serve at all. It's not all about just sitting at my feet. Like as in the Christian life, there are things that you have to serve. The Bible says to go eat into all the world and preach the gospel. There are things as Christians that we need to do. We need to serve other people. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for, for sorry, a, a life a ransom for many. The o- only reason Jesus Christ came here was not for all to serve him, but that he would serve other people. When he's in the, in the Last Supper, he washes all the disciples' feet. God pr- proved that it's our duty to serve other people. He, he has that clear throughout his, the, the, um, the apostles. Once upon a time, there was a man. And this man dared God to speak. He says, God, I want you to catch another bush on fire like you did for Moses. And if you do that... 
I'll follow you. God, if you will tear down a wall like you did for, for Joshua, then I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you. I'll, I'll fight for you. God, if you, if you calm the Sea of Galilee for me, I'll, I'll hearken unto your words. And he, he had these precautions for the Lord, and he sat there and he waited for the Lord's to answer back. And as he's sitting there, he's staring at the bush, he's staring at the wall, he's staring at the sea. Okay, what's God going to do? God answers, but not in a way that he expected. God said, well, I did send fire, but not for a bush again, but for a church. I broke a wall down, but it wasn't made of brick. No, I broke down a wall, but it was made of sin. I calmed a storm, but not of the sea again. No, I calmed a storm of a soul. And God stopped and waited for this man's reply. But this man was so focused on this bush, on this wall, on the sea, that some time passed. He's like, okay, God, where are you? I'm looking for your, your response, and I don't see it. Finally, God answers this man. And says, because you have looked at the bush, because you looked at the wall, because you looked at the sea, you didn't see what I did. The man looked at God and says, God, are you crazy? He goes, God, have you lost your mind? God, have you lost your power? Like, come on, why don't you do these things for me? God answers by saying this. Have you lost your hearing? This man wanted to do stuff for God. He said, God, show me this, and I will go head first. God, tear down this wall, and I will fight for you. Do anything, God, I will follow you. But the only problem is he didn't listen in the first place. So we can be here, and we can work left and right and serving like we should. But if we don't first listen and sit at the feet of Jesus, we forget the reason that we're serving in the first place. Four lessons for two women. The one was almost had it. She almost had it just right. She was serving as hard as she could. She just forgot the most important part. Now sitting at the feet of Jesus. And there's Mary. Everywhere you go, Mary's at the feet of Jesus. She's one in the hearer's word. He, she's worshiping God. And she's also serving. Now, like I said, I've seen quite a few churches throughout my lifetime. This church, when it comes to serving, is incredible. I heard a, a statistic one time that 90% of the work that needs to be done at church is done by 10% of the crowd. And a lot of churches you go to, that's, it's the same people week after week after week teaching the same class over and over again. But I, truthfully, I will say, in this church, I do not see that very much. Everyone is wanting to get involved, and I absolutely love that. It's incredible to see. Like, what a church family that is, to help one another out. But if all we are focused on is working and serving, and we do it over and over, and we forget the reason that we're serving in the first place, God says that we have it all wrong. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much.